Well, this morning we're returning to and continuing our current series of messages, uh, thinking about the church and asking the question, what does this mean? And, and so far we've looked at the topics of the Lord's Supper, child dedication, and then baptism. And now this morning we're going to pick up the topic of church membership, but a lot of what I say will be applicable beyond the topic of church membership. And each time we've picked up and examined one of these topics, we've asked the simple but profound question, simply, what does this mean? Because we have to remember that God is not pleased with meaningless ritual. Uh, The Old Testament book of Deuteronomy tells us to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and Jesus said that's the greatest commandment. The Lord wants our hearts, and meaningless ritual is not our hearts. So it's been my prayer throughout this series that all of us would find ourselves compelled by the deep meaning contained in each of these important practices within the church. And then it would be out of that deep meaning that we would respond. So let's jump into God's Word together, and if you're following along, go ahead and turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, We'll be uh, beginning there, though we'll be looking at a couple of additional passages as well. And and the first thing I want us to see, want us to, to see, is that as followers of Jesus, we need one another. Can I just say that again? As followers of Jesus, we need one another. I trust that that's very obvious and that we understand that, that we know that, but we need to be reminded of that from time to time. And this is Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see, the day, and the day is capitalized, drawing near. So did you catch what this says? As fellow, followers of, as fellow followers of Jesus, as fellow Christians, we're to stir up one another, or another translation says, spur one another on to love and good works, and we're not to give up meeting together with fellow Christians. And the day, in the English Standard Version, is capitalized, capital D, and, and the day that's referred to here is the day of Jesus' return. And obviously this tells us that the temptation to neglect meeting together was a challenge then. It it faced the church 2,000 years ago, and it's a challenge for us today. There's that temptation uh, to stop meeting together. And it says, as the day of his return, the day, the day of Christ's return is drawing near, let me just say this, each day we are a day closer to the Lord Jesus' glorious return return, his promised and glorious return. Now, the New Living Translation is known for being a little bit more paraphrase-oriented, and it captures the essence of this, and I think it's helpful. I want to read these verses in that translation. A different way of saying the same thing. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Now, I would just say this. As we consider the events of the past year and a half, one thing we've experienced firsthand is that there is no substitute for meeting together with fellow believers for corporate worship. This call is very, very relevant. Am I thankful for technology? Absolutely. I'm thankful for continued, the continued ministry of technology. But there is no substitute for coming together with brothers and sisters in Christ and turning together to God's Word and together lifting our voices in songs of praise. No substitute. Uh, Now, with uh, uh, with that in mind, I want to take a step back and just kind of think about the big picture of the book of Hebrews, uh, the background, if you will, for just a minute. Now, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, that is, uh, originally addressed Christians coming from a Jewish background uh, who were actively enduring significant suffering because of their faith in Jesus. Um, And because of the severe pushback or severe opposition that they were experiencing, uh, some were tempted to give up on following Jesus and return to their Jewish roots. And we can see why they were so tempted if we roll our eyes down a few more verses in Hebrews chapter 10 to verse 32 uh, to verse 34. But uh, recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. 
sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those who were so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison and joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Do you catch that? I mean, they actually joyfully accepted the, the plundering of the confiscation of their property. But they were an amazing picture of enduring persecution. But the persecution has been wearing them down. They're suffering persecution. There's no question about it. And then there is a temptation that was in play to return back to the former ways, to their Jewish roots as a result of the opposition. And it's with this background that the words of verses 24 and 25 make perfect sense. It's often easiest to skip out on meeting together with fellow Christians when things are difficult. It was true then and it's true today. When things are going badly, in times of pain and pressure, and that's what the original audience of Hebrews, we don't uh, know how to unpack all of the details behind that, but in times of pain and pressure, it's easy to neglect meeting together. In times of personal pain, and I think many of us know this, it's easy to find ourselves not thinking accurately or, or wisely, but wrongly assuming that our problems are problems that nobody else faces. And that our struggles are, are unique to us. Nobody else has been through that. And, and they're just too embarrassing and unusual. And as a result, we give up meeting uh, together. And again, I say that is a wrong assumption. It is almost always a wrong assumption to say nobody else is going through the same thing. Uh, that is almost always categorically wrong in, any, in a group of any size. And here's the problem, though, with this temptation, is it's at these times when we're tempted to throw in the towel, so to speak, and to give up that we need each other the most. We need our brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage, encourage us through painful, disorienting, and confusing times and circumstances. Though, and yes, painful, disorienting, and confusing things come to all of us. It's common to living in a fallen world. If you're not living through a storm right now, you probably just came out of one, and you're probably going into one. I don't mean to be negative. I'm just saying the storms of life come. If you're not in one right now, I'm very thankful. But it, they will come. And it is in those times, in those disorienting, confusing times, that we need the encouragement of our brothers and sisters in Christ. The Bible teaches us that we need to persevere. And one of the tools that God has ordained for us to persevere is Christian community fellowship to help us to persevere. And you say, what does persevere mean? Uh, kids, a very simple definition. Keep on keeping on. We won't persevere on our own. But together, God has built a structure, the local church, to help us to persevere. With that in mind, I, I got a question for you. Do you underline in your Bible? Do you write things down? Do you mark them down? If you do, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 is a section to underline or otherwise mark down. We need to remember what this says, and more importantly, we need to live it out. These verses correct unhealthy habits that are all too common. Have you ever heard the phrase, and I won't ask for a show of hands, but I think probably all of us have heard this, Someone say, I'm, I'm a Christian, but I don't have a church home. Or I'm a Christian, but I don't attend a local church. And I know uh, that I've heard this kind of statement, and sometimes, actually often, it's followed by a claim of personal Bible reading and prayer. Now, don't get me wrong. It's a great thing anytime anybody is in their Bible and in prayer. I'm very thankful. But Hebrews 10 tells us that as followers of Jesus, we need one another. And so these verses correct uh, some of our practices. Uh, recognize I'm probably not speaking to us, but we probably all observed situations uh, where it is tempting in a consumeristic culture to kind of uh, bounce around from church to church looking for the best product, so to speak. You know what I mean? Some people call it church hopping. 
bouncing from place to place without ever committing and connecting deeply enough to fulfill these verses. We've probably all seen it, and probably many of us have done it. It's so easy to do, to kind of run in and run out and maybe bounce in here, bounce in there, but never to connect deeply enough that there can be that uh, encouragement. Now, I'll be the first to quickly say I totally understand that the Lord sometimes moves people to change churches, and that can be a very healthy thing, but the goal should always be in that situation uh, uh, seeking uh, seeking a fellowship to commit to not to simply float around and drift sort of in and out, in here a little bit and out there a little bit. That shouldn't be a long-term plan. I, I realize this can be kind of uncomfortable to talk about, but, and I recognize that probably this isn't us, but we, we pastors have the phrase Christmas Eve and Easter Christians. You know what I'm talking about? And again, I'm so thankful that those are big, big times in the life of the church. What a wonderful thing. But these verses would speak to that, saying, no, we need each other. We need more than that. Don't give up meeting uh, together. Once or twice a year isn't a good plan. We need one another. And finally, this speaks very honestly, probably this does speak to some of us, uh, to the common temptation, I understand it's a very common temptation, to attend regularly, but to never connect deeply enough for the mutual encouragement and accountability that God has designed to occur. You know what I'm saying? To never connect deeply enough, and I'm not saying with everybody, you can't connect that much with everybody in one local church, but to not connect deeply enough with some people within that congregation, enough that there can be that encouragement, that stirring one another up, that spurring one another on. Friends, it's difficult, if not impossible, to fulfill Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 with only an hour a week or less, and quickly heading out the door. We need each other. That's how God has designed us as the local church. I recognize probably a lot of us know this is true, and, and that's good. I don't mean this by way of a, you know, a, a rebuke in any way, but just to say sometimes we need to be reminded of the truth, especially in a culture that is tempted uh, so much to kind of not do these things. And we need to be, again, uh, my desire is just to say, let's look at what God's Word says and that we would, through that, all find all of ourselves stirred up to want to desire these things more and more. Now, moving on, I want to look at a couple more passages, and I want us to see the truth that God has designed the local church to hold its members accountable. And to see this truth, I want to turn to a couple of passages that deal with a subject that is sometimes described using the terminology as church discipline, but I want us to see how this deals with the topic of fellowship in church membership. And we'll be looking at Matthew 18, followed by 1 Corinthians 5. And before I go a whole lot farther, I need to point out that both of these passages have a lot of details, and there is no way we are going to unpack everything today. Uh, But instead of getting into all the details, I want us uh, to pause and make a couple of quick big-picture observations. I think they'll be very obvious to us. And first, looking at Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20. Now listen to these words from Jesus, a powerful challenge. If your brother, and I would say by application brother or sister, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. You notice there's the mention of the church here. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. So what's this passage about? Well, big picture, uh, it's the process that we're required as Christians to follow if a Christian brother or sister sins against us. Did you notice how verse 15 begins? If your brother sins against you. 
uh, the New Living Translate, uh, or the, the New International Version just says, if your brother or sister sins. And so really, this, the, the, we're looking at it saying, if your brother sins against you, but the application of this process is beyond that, just if someone is caught in a sin in general, whether or not the offense is directly against uh, the person who becomes aware. Uh, but this is how you respond when, you become, when there's, you know, you're offended, when someone sins against you. The first step is going to the person. And catch this, going to the person without involving others. And this avoids gossip, it avoids unnecessary divisions, and it avoids the grievous taking of sides. That said, if we want to be honest, I'm not asking for a show of hands. I'm not, I, you know, I think we've all been guilty here. But our natural default path, if we're honest with ourselves and, and the condition of our hearts, I, I'm pretty confident this is true for all of us, is the temptation is, at least, to talk to and go to everyone else except the one that we're biblically required to go to. I see some of you nodding and you go, you know exactly what I mean. Friends, Jesus calls us off the path of least resistance and away from the deadly poison of gossip. That said, we're not primarily going to unpack this process, though that would be an excellent sermon, and we might do that sometime, but we're not primarily talking about the process today, but this order here is vitally important, and we would all do well to review it and to reflect on it. But for now, if you're following along, roll your eyes down to verse 17, and it says, if he refuses to listen to them, let uh, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you a Gentile and a tax collector. So if after going to the person, they, they refuse to listen. So then, okay, the first step has been completed. And, and then after going with two or three others, they continue to refuse to listen. Eventually, it goes before the whole church. But friends, that is a last resort or a final step, not the beginning, Right? And can you see the big picture here? Unrepentant sin results in a process of confrontation and discipline, loving confrontation. And discipline up to removal from Christian fellowship. And all of this demonstrates that there are boundaries in Christian fellowship. And we seek to live this out through what we call church membership. Now, I should point out that Jesus treated unbelievers, he treated Gentiles and, and tax collectors with compassion. But he did not treat them as disciples, you see? Was Jesus compassionate to the, uh, to, to the crowds that were harassed and helpless and lost? Oh, you better believe it. But he didn't treat them as disciples, as his followers, if they were not. This implies a boundary to the community of believers, to Christian fellowship. And it's also extremely important to understand that the goal here is not vengeance or humiliation of the sinner, but rather restoration. The local church is expected to provide accountability, and this involves taking persistent, willful, and unrepentant sin very, very seriously. But the discipline must be understood but in discipline, we must understand that the goal is always, ultimately, restoration. We see a similar kind of scenario found in uh, the New Testament letter of 1 Corinthians, uh, chapter 5. And, and I'll read the passage now. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans, for a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you, rather, ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though I am absent in the body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver the man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. So is the discipline ser serious? Yes. But do you notice, again, the goal is that he be saved. The, the goal is restoration, repentance. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? 
Cast out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our pas- for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the leaven of bread, with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or an idolater or reveler or drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge. God judges those outside, and then catch the phrase, purge the evil person from among you. Now, there's a whole lot going on here, but let me just summarize some of the background. Uh, There was a serious and continuing willful sexual immorality going on within the church in Corinth. A man has his father's wife. Uh, We won't go into that any further. Uh, But the church didn't have a problem with it, and they were doing nothing. And you see that, you know, and you are arrogant. And the Apostle Paul doesn't waste any words addressing this situation, but he rather makes it perfectly clear that this situation must be dealt with. And he's emphatic. They are to remove the man from fellowship and hand him over to Satan. And yes, that's strong, but, yet, but the goal remains restoration. The goal of this severe removal from fellowship is to confront him with the seriousness of his sin and bring him to repentance and restoration. And so what's the big picture here when it comes to and involves what we call church membership? Both of these passages teach that the local church has the high responsibility of providing accountability and and uh, the term discipline is is, is appropriate. And some of us might be asking, "I, I see what you're saying, but what does this have to do with membership? Well, though church membership is not described in in those words, there are clearly boundaries to Christian fellowship, and church membership is a commitment saying, please hold me accountable. It's a commitment saying, I'm in my right mind, and I'm making a, a commitment to this local church, and I'm saying, please say something to me if I give up on meeting together. Please say something if I start down a destructive and sinful path. Please say something. If I'm giving my permission to say something, if I'm going to do something that's going to destroy me and bring dishonor to the name of Christ, I'm asking for this because in my right mind, I know I need it. We need to realize this because we're sinners. Friends, every one of us is a sinner. And we realize our capacity to fall into sin and we realize we need the support of our local church family. Now let's unpack this a little bit more. Here at our three free church, um, everyone, we believe very strongly that everyone should be welcome to come and investigate Jesus. And obviously, if you're investigating Jesus but haven't yet committed your life to him, we entirely understand the reality that uh, not striving to live according to God's standards, if you're not yet... If you're if you have not yet bowed your knee to him, is um, uh, understandable. Uh, we're not saying we're, we're thrilled about it, but uh, you should just put it this way. Uh, if you're not yet a Christian, we don't realistically expect you to live as a Christian if you're not one. That just wouldn't make sense. Uh, we are so glad that you are investigating who Jesus is. On the other hand, when we make a commitment to follow Christ and become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Yes, I'm bowing my knee to King Jesus. When we place our belief, our faith, our trust in him and him alone to save us and become his followers, from that day forward, we must, through the enabling and transforming work of the Holy Spirit who indwells all believers, be changing and growing. Obedience to God matters. And at this point, we'd want someone to lovingly confront us if we were falling into something that would destroy us and bring dishonor to the name of Christ. Membership is simply saying, I'm a committed follower of Christ, and I know that I need this. Another way to go about, uh, to look at this uh, and to think about church membership is to step back and think about something that isn't church membership. 
Who here, maybe I shouldn't ask for a show of hands, but you can think about it. You can raise your hand if you want. But who here has uh, said, I'm going to do a lifestyle change and I'm going to get a, on a diet or exercise plan? I see some grimaces. Okay? And uh, if we were honest with ourselves about this, um, truth be told, we've probably failed m far more times than we've succeeded. Now, that's not to say that a lifestyle change, that at some points people haven't wonderfully and gloriously uh, you know, succeeded in, in a lifestyle change, diet, and exercise plan, but uh, I, I would venture to rate the failure rate is far the majority. Um, you know, th those New Year's resolutions last maybe you know, a couple of hours for some, maybe a couple of weeks for others, right? Well, what's the key to success? Normally, at least what I've heard, is that one of the keys to success, if you're making that kind of a resolution and desiring to make that kind of a change, is pursuing those new goals with some friends for mutual support, encouragement, and accountability. Pursuing those goals together rather than in isolation. I see some of you nodding, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Does that sound like Hebrews 10, 24, and 25? Well, it should, because it is. Our commitment to the local church is really a bit like that. Uh, final observation I, I want to make this morning is church membership is a healthy two-way commitment. Membership is a commitment that runs in a couple of different directions. It's a commitment from the individual to the church family, and it's a commitment from the church family to the individual. From the individual to the church family, it's joyfully committing to attend, serve, give to, and support this local church. It's simply saying, I'm making this church home. And those who make it home, members who make it home, of course, will attend, serve, give of time, give of finances, pray for. That, that, that's part of it, being, being home. Connection doesn't mean that you have to be there every time the doors are open, but it does mean a meaningful connection and personal investment. I like to think of it like this. Who says, what would it look like to healthily connect with a local church? Well, I, 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 I tentatively suggest at least three things. It might be a little bit more than that. But one would be saying corporate worship, Sunday morning worship service, needs to be a priority. Worshiping together. I'd also suggest that there needs to be a connection in a smaller group for fellowship and mutual encouragement. Could that be a Bible study group? Could that be a uh, Sunday school class? Could that be a uh, team that's serving in some way? Could that be just an informal relationship where uh, two or three gather together to uh, share life and encourage one another? The answer to all of that is yes. And I think that it would also ideally involve serving in some way. So that there would be connection in corporate worship, there would be a connection in a smaller group where we can pray for one another and encourage one another in a closer way, in a deeper way, and that there would be also the desire to serve in some way. That said, the commitment goes the other way as well. There's deep love, support, and commitment to care, and yes, accountability that flows from the church family to the member or the individual. It's a two-way commitment. And... Uh, that's not all. Think with me. We are an active and vibrant church with a strong legacy. I, you know, I was looking it up this morning trying to remind myself all the way back to 1885. And part of being a member practically means there's the privilege of helping set direction and make decisions. Part of being a member means that you have a say in, 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 in discussing and voting on the direction of our church. And, and you say, well, what, what do we need to vote? What do we need to vote about anyway? Well, having a vote means input on the church's direction. It means Approving financial reports. It means approving who serves as elder, deacon, trustee, Christian education team. And it means being eligible to be considered for a leadership position. I think we can see that membership is a commitment that comes with both privileges and responsibilities. And with that in mind, an important aspect of all of this is that members need to be believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our church's statement of faith, the Evangelical Free Church's statement of faith, has a, phrase, has a couple of sentences that say it this way, and it's just right. We believe that the true church comprises uh, all those who have been justified by God's grace through faith in, alone in Christ alone. 
They are, unite, they are united by the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ, of which he is the head. The true church is manifest in local churches whose membership should be composed only of believers. What this means is that when we understand the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we say yes and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, that you are then eligible to become a member in a local church because you are now part of the church, capital C, the, the universal church. And this is why some people wonder, so why, why do we ask those who are applying for membership to share their testimony? Is because to be a member of a local church, which is a, a local expression of the Church of Jesus Christ, the Church, capital C, you have to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, capital C. And how do you become a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, capital C? You become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. So sharing our testimony is saying, I, I want people to know that I, I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a believer. And it, this is important because if you're helping to set a direction for a church that is followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's important that we're followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. In, in free church history, uh, there, is, there was a phrase, Al Thunberg and I were just talking about it this morning, but uh, all believers but only believers. And the idea was that people would be eligible for membership in the local church if they were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, in essentials, unity, and non-essentials, charity. So, uh, but we need to be believers, and that came out of a situation in Sweden and Norway where you were a member of a state church by nature of your citizenship. So if you were Norwegian, you were a member of the, Nor of the Norwegian state church. If you were Swedish, it was the same. And people said, this isn't right because being a, a member of a church on the basis of your nationality, that has nothing to do with your relationship with Jesus. Therefore, the phrase, all believers, but we need to be believers, only believers. Now, if you're not quite there yet, I would tell you this morning that you could make that commitment today and in the quietness of your own heart, admit that you're a sinner and ask for forgiveness, place your faith, your belief, your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone to save you on the basis of what he did on the cross, dying as our substitute. Tell the Lord Jesus that you're committing your life to him. That said, for the rest of us, I just want to think about all of this a little bit more as we conclude. I'm convinced that for people, it's easy to naturally fear commitment. Would you agree with that? I think that's true. We naturally run from being pinned down, and this, this works it out in all kinds of ways. I, I imagine that's probably why marriage rates are dropping in our society, part of it. We, we run from being pinned down. We don't like commitment. We, it's, our hearts naturally flee from it. And that's probably why it's easy to never join a local church. But commitment is essential, and God has designed us to commit. So I ask you to think about, are you a member? Have you joined the team? Are you not a member? I'd encourage you to pray about it. That's all, I'm gonna, that, that's all we're saying. I say this with some boldness because I believe that it is healthy to make a commitment, a, that the commitment is pleasing to God. I believe that making a, a commitment to the local church is a healthy step in spiritual growth. God intended us to commit to a specific local church, and I'd encourage us and I encourage membership because it's how we live out God's design. And if after praying about it, you're saying, okay, what's the next step? Let me know. We would love uh, to uh, have a gathering. Some people would call it a class. I'll just call it a gathering um, where we can uh, talk about what our church believes and uh, share a little bit about the church for those who are interested and have questions. Uh, if it's a big group, we'll schedule it at, uh, sometime uh, after the service or maybe during Sunday school. If it's a small group, we can schedule it in my office uh, at any time that works. Uh, but if you're interested in, and have more questions, you want to pursue the next step of finding out about church membership, love to talk about it. Who's played sports? Good. My guess is that it's probably most of us have. Picture in your mind a football huddle. Joining a team involves commitment. Each of those people in the huddle committed to learn the plays, to practice, exerted effort, and depending on who was fitting the bill, they probably even it might even got expensive, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, why join a team? Well, that's a good question. There's something special about being connected with each other and on a mission together. It's exciting, but it takes a commitment. We see that in sports. It's true in the church. 
And it's my cry, that, uh, it's a cry of my heart that we would have far more commitment to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ than we would to sports, not less. We covered a lot of ground. We've seen as followers of Jesus Christ, we need each other. Friends, that's so true. We need to remember. We've seen that God designed the local church to hold its members accountable, and we've seen that church membership is a healthy two-way commitment. And I hope and pray that we all have some fresh motivation to connect and commit to Christian fellowship in growing ways. I know we're in different places. I don't know what that might look like for you, but I'd encourage you to pray about it. For some of us, it might be saying, I'm ready to investigate and commit to church membership. For others, it might be saying, I need to connect with a Sunday school class or maybe just simply spend some intentional time with a Christian friend and, and share together and pray for one another. Maybe looking back a few weeks, it's saying, I need uh, to pursue child dedication or baptism. I, I don't know what, that, what this is, but as part of pursuing your best year yet with Jesus, I'd encourage you as I pray to just ask this whole, the Holy Spirit to show you what it means for you to take just another step in pursuing your best year yet with Jesus. Let's pray together, and then we can close in song. Heavenly Father, through the power of your Holy Spirit, in these moments right now, remind us in many ways of truth we already know. Help us, uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit, to see what it looks like for us to take a step of growing in our relationship with you. Guide us, we pray. And we thank you for this local church. We thank you for the encouragement and the strength that, we, that so many of us have been blessed with because of this local church. We thank you for the privilege it is, the wonder that it is, to joyfully worship you together. And it's in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen.